Hi, software engineers. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about requirements engineering. In the last video, we talked about requirements elicitation, requirements analysis. That's the act of getting the requirements out of the stakeholders to understand what it is that they need so that then you can go back to your team and start discussing, well, what exactly are we going to build? So that process, requirements modeling or requirements specification is the next phase. So we've figured out who the stakeholders are, we've begun getting those requirements out, but now we need an agreement between the engineers and the customers as to what we're building. And then we have a process for converting that into something that is unambiguous for the developers to work on. Because with multiple different people working on the system, you need to have an authority as to, okay, this is what we are actually trying to build. So requirement specification um, is that second phase, the requirements modeling, turning user requirements into actionable statements um, all software engineers can understand. So the restating of requirements in a technical format. The inputs to this phase, to requirements modeling, are varied, right? We had a host of different elicitation techniques. We had surveys, we had interviews, we had prototypes. We just had all this type of, th these vectors of information. And each of those comes with a different type of information. Sometimes you're gonna get Likert numbers, like how much did you like this? Five out of seven, hooray. Sometimes you're gonna get full paragraphs of descriptions of what worked or what didn't work. Sometimes you'll get something very technical, like here are the buttons that the user pressed during the prototype. And what does that tell you about how they want to use it? So because there's so many different varied inputs, we need folks in requirements engineering to be able to sift through that data to come up with something that is actually usable by the developers. So it's important to remember that when we talk about analysis and elicitation, that's customer focused, okay? Modeling and specification, that's developer focused. Human readable versus more technical, okay? And so the requirements engineer is that transit point. This is, I love this comic. So I'll give you, I'll give you a second to take a look at it. Um, this is this is pretty famous. This has been uh, on the internets for a long time. Um, how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it, how the beta testers what they received, how it was described, and at the end of the day, what the customer really needed was the tire swing. It's another good example of understanding your customer's needs, but but this is this is you know kind of the joking understanding of of how requirements work. It's it's like the worst game of telephone ever. You know you are getting um you're getting input from so many different individuals trying to figure it out, and then you have to convert it to something that you can build. It's really really tough. So we need to have different methodologies for writing down requirements. Um, <coughs> excuse me, if we are in, if we're in a plan driven format, well, we might need more documentation. If your requirements are not going to change, then you have the time to write more documentation. It's likely you're in an environment where you will need more documentation, such as a distributed team or, um, working with a piece of hardware that's not going to change, or you're going to have to send the software to some. Uh, approval agency, some sort of federal, some sort of government agency, whatever it might be, and they're probably going to want to see the requirements documents. So we have the more formal specification sorts of things, like an SRS document, software requirement specification, which we'll look at, and then we have the more um, agile methods for doing requirements, such as user stories. So this is effectively what Scrum uses. Um, it, it comes in different language, whether it's specifically called a user story or something else, but user story is a pretty good general term for this. And the idea is uh, we'll get input from the user and it will be written down in such a way that it's easy for us to basically iterate on it constantly and work with it with the developers. But we'll, we'll show that in just a second. So no matter what you use, it's really important to come up with something that when a developer reads it, they understand what it is they're trying to build. That there's not a ton of guesswork that has to go into it. That they can look at it and another developer could look at it. And in general, they're going to agree. 
Because otherwise, your software is dependent on who picks up which requirement? That's not good. Uh, you, want to, you want there to be agreement from beginning to end. But we're going to start with something that's actually kind of in between Agile and plan-driven. You might argue it's probably a bit more plan-driven. I've seen a few Agile teams use these, and that's use cases. So a use case falls under the same category of uh, UML. It's part of the unified modeling language that you know we see with class diagrams. So that's probably the, the most famous UML diagram that you might have seen at some point. You know, the rectangle that has the class name and, and has some methods and has the, or has the variables, has the methods, the fields and the methods. We're going to do a whole thing on UML in, in a few units. Um, but uh, use cases are a part of UML. So it is a uh, technique for visually uh, drawing your requirements, but there's also some text that goes along with it. So there's two, there's two links here. Uh, the first one I want to look at is actually the, the second link. And this is uh, this um, textbook that was written by Laurie Williams at, at North Carolina State University, who is um, very, very well known in software engineering, particularly in agile methods. Disclaimer, she was my PhD advisor and she's a wonderful person. But beyond that, uh, this is the textbook, uh, part of the textbook that she wrote. And this is a quick example of what a UML uh, case looks like. So what we have here is we have, um, we have the actor, which is the user in this case, and how they're going to interact with the system. Uh, this arrow points to uh, the, the system boundary, which is the rectangle, and then the, the oval inside talks about how they would interact with the system. Okay? Now, it's not just the picture. You also have um, these descriptions of what happens. So here is, here is UC8 from a Monopoly game. So the flow of events for the buy the house use case. Preconditions, it's the player's turn. The player's not rolled the dice. The player has Monopoly on one or more color groups. The main flow, when a player has all the tradable cells in a color group, this player is said to have a Monopoly on the color group. A player may build houses in the property cells in the color group the player has a monopoly on by pressing the buy house button before he or she rolls the dice. See subflow one and error flows one and two. The price of the house is determined by the cell after buying the house. The status of the player is updated and displayed. Okay, you get the idea. Um, this is meant to be very specific. This is meant to be something that no matter who reads it, you have a pretty good under understanding of what's going on and how you're going to go about programming the system. It has the subflows, the things that can happen potentially at that point, such as buying the house, get the monopoly. But then the alternative flows. If they don't have enough money, they try to do it, says no. So these are, these are test cases. Now, this other, the other link gives a more full diagram. So here you have a user type passenger. Um, but that passenger could be a tour guide, could be a miner, could be a passenger with special needs, which are special instances of this actor. And how do they interact with the system? Well, the tour guide has the ability to check people in. The passenger does individual check-in, but also goes through security screening. As a part of individual check-in, you could do it at the kiosk or at the counter. And so this is more of a visual representation of this activity. But what if we looked at um, this one? So this is for online shopping. So uh, everyone is a web customer, but you could be registered or you could be new. A new customer is allowed to view items in the system, um, but is not allowed to make purchases. They have to be a registered customer in order to make purchase. In order to make purchase, you have to have viewed the items and then eventually you have to make a checkout. So you can see how all of this ties together to give a, a, a kind of a, a top-down picture of what this software should do. So these are use cases. Um, they are, they're pretty popular to use, um, in, in plan driven development. Um, again, you could use them in a more agile environment. If you wanted to draw those diagrams, you probably wouldn't go as far as to write the actual case descriptions, uh, in an agile environment, just because of the amount of documentation, but to have that top level document to show the actors and show how they interact with the system, that's pretty common. Um, but if you did do the, the description, it typically goes into a larger document called an SRS. So uh, an SRS, it has a formal specification that you can find from the IEEE. Um, but in general, it is a, I want to specify all of the things that are, that is going on in my system. And here is what it's going to look like. So let's go back, let's go back to uh, Dr. Williams's, Laurie Williams's um, book. And I want to scroll down 
to her example SRS document. So there's there's another example of a use case. The player draws a card, buys a house. You see how that works. Oh, okay. So first off, I have to point out when she <laughs> when she wrote this textbook, I was still a grad student with her, and so me and my friends are all here. So there I am as the development manager. Not sure how I got that role, but go me. Uh, my friend Lucas Lehman, who's a professor at UNC Wilmington. My friend Nachi, he is a he's a big shot at Microsoft Research. In my opinion, he's pretty awesome. Uh, not that Shi Wei and Hema are not wonderful too. Uh, I think Shi Wei is at IBM. I don't know where Hema is right now, but um, anyway, that just amuses me every time I see it. So anyway, well, there's your big off. There's there's the huge use case diagram for playing Monopoly. That looks exciting. You have the player who can enter player info. Um, or, you know, trade cards. So this is at the beginning. Um, they, they move, and part of moving is rolling the dice. Notice that it includes roll dice. You must roll dice in order to move. But you could also pass go, go to jail, visit jail, visit all the good, wonderful things you do in a Monopoly game. Um, other things you could do on your turn, buy, buy a house, draw a card. You get the idea. So now we scroll down to the individual cases, and it just goes. I encourage you to go look at this later when you really need to go to sleep because it is keeps going okay so misuse cases those are use cases specifically around you know messing up the software so this is a way of you know we we model how we think people might try to abuse it so we can prevent it looky there nfrs oh my gosh non-functional requirements performance usability and it has information like the system should update the user within 0.1 seconds we talked about this two videos ago what an nfr is looky there isn't that fantastic and constraints done in Java, use JUnit fit. Now look at this, the requirements dependency table. This shows which use cases are reliant on which other use cases. So imagine a world where you're building software and the requirements change, okay? And you have to go and change the diagram, you have to change the use case text, you have to come down here to this table and potentially make changes. You cannot use an SRS in an agile environment you will go crazy. Now, it's possible you could do some of this if you had a tool that could manage it for you, but um, no, this is, this is why if you have high requirements volatility, you are moving more agile. That is just, it's just the way it works. So anyway, there's that. Um, and you can see more examples of use case diagrams um, that, that would appear in an SRS um, still at that other link. So there you go. Jump back over here to the slides. So that's kind of a very plan driven way of doing requirements specification is you follow a document like that. You, you draw out the use cases, you, um, you know, specify uh, all that information. And I think that's a good thing to see. We're not going to ask you to do that in this class because you would hate us probably. Um, but what we will definitely do in this class are user stories. So user stories are a very common way of thinking about requirements in an agile environment. There's a wonderful one pager at this link right here. Um, I've got a couple of that, that link you can find here and there's another, whoop, and there's another one later in the slides um, uh, here uh, from Mountain Goat Software. Both of those are gonna be really good explanations for what you might wanna do or, or how to understand it. But the basic idea is this. We are starting from a point of conversation with the user, okay? So what we want is basically a one sentence explanation of what the system should do. Tell us one thing. Don't go overboard, don't, don't, do too, don't do too much with it. Just give us one thing that the software should do. And then we will take that and build from there, okay? So the idea is you write it on something like an index card. Nothing huge, because if you're writing something that takes more than just an index card, you're probably doing something that is more almost SRS-like. You want something short and actionable and easy to understand and easy to follow, okay? So the level of detail, enough time to estimate to implement, right, it focuses on the user needs, but there shouldn't be any implementation bias here. Nothing on what algorithm are you going to use, what UI, what database, all that sort of jazz. So. Here's an example. When a transaction causes a customer's account to go into overdraft, transfer money from overdraft protection, if any. Okay, I mean, it's a feature. It, it, it just specifies this is something that should happen. Produce a statement for each account showing transaction date, number, pay amount, the sample statement is attached, make the report look like, there you go. It's just 
you know, this is something where the, the, the stakeholder says, I need it to do this. And then you as the requirements engineer says, cool, let's write it down. And so you write it down. Um, when the GPS has contact with two or fewer satellites for more than 30 seconds, does it display the message poor satellite contact and wait for confirmation by the user? If contact improves for confirmation, clear the message automatically. Now, this is not necessarily something that the user, the stakeholder, would just spat out. They don't necessarily know how many satellites make a good GPS contact, for instance. So the conversation is you as a requirements engineer are sitting down with the, the stakeholder and you are talking about these back and forth until eventually you can write something down on the card. So um, it's great if you can write a user story as, as a blank, I want to or the system shall blank, so that blank. Um, so some other examples, let's go back over here to um, the Mountain Goat page. Uh, as a power user, I can specify files or folders to backup based on file size, date created, and date modified. Okay. As a user, I can indicate folders not to backup so that my backup drive isn't filled up with things I don't need saved. So it's, it's telling us here both as someone who just uses the software as a user, you can indicate the software that's not to backup based on so it doesn't fill it up. But then as a power user, someone who would probably want to have more control, you can give more feature such a thing. So imagine we're coming up with, with user stories for, for sys, okay? So as a faculty member, I should be able to view all of my advisees' academic record transcript. As a student, you should be able to view only your own academic records transcript. See, makes sense, right? You know, we, 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 we have a feature that says uh, the system shall uh, the system shall display an academic records transcript that based upon a student's course of study shows what courses need to be completed in order to graduate from UVA. That's a user story. That's perfectly fine. Does it give information about how that's supposed to lay, be laid out? Does it give information about exactly what the table should look like or anything like that? No, it doesn't those would come out through the, the, the development of the software. This is establishing what the software should do, okay? So this is, uh, these are what user stories are. These are kind of how they're used in an in, in agile environment. So what we're gonna do for the um, guided practice this week, actually, is write some user stories. So in an upcoming video, I'm gonna talk about the planning game which is an aspect of XP that we talked about, talked about back in the Agile video, which is exactly how do you do user stories and then how do you write them down to then eventually come up with some sort of cool system. So we'll see about that one in a future video. I hope you're doing well. Glad to see you as always. Take care. Bye.